Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, today I'm going to describe uh, receptors of neurotransmitter. In some of the previous lecture also, we have come across some examples of neurotransmitter receptor. Today uh, we are going to see in some more details how these receptors work and what are basic types of receptors how these receptors are linked to the activity of the neurotransmitter and how they affect the biochemical events in the postsynaptic cell and ultimately how they affect the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane. So let's get started. So first of all we may ask this simple question. Why do neurotransmitters require receptors at all? If we look at the structure of the chemical sinus we see that unlike electrical synapses, there is a significant gap between the presynaptic cell and the postsynaptic cell. And this gap is called a synaptic cleft, and because of this physical gap and discontinuity of the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell the presynaptic cell has to produce a diffusible ion or molecule so that it can affect the postsynaptic cell and in case of synaptic transmission these diffusible molecules are known as the neurotransmitters. But so far, almost 99% of the neurotransmitters are lipophobic. That means they cannot pass through the membrane of the postsynaptic cell. So they are unable to interact with the intracellular biochemical processes of the postsynaptic cell. So their action has to be mediated by certain receptors and through these receptors the neurotransmitters are able to affect or bring change changes in the permeability of the membrane or in the biochemistry of the postsynaptic cell. So that is the main reason why these receptors are required. If these neurotransmitters are able to pass through the membrane then there won't be any requirement of these receptors, particularly these membrane bound receptors. The next question is what happens to a receptor when the neurotransmitter or the ligand binds to it? So we will see this in the context of these two types of neurotransmitter receptor. One group as we call ionotropic receptors and the other group called metabotropic receptors. These ionotropic receptors are also called ligand-gated ion channels. 
since this receptor are nothing but ion channels but the opening and closing is controlled by a ligand and here the ligand is ligand is neurotransmitter so in case of ionotropic receptor once the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor there is opening or closing of the channel and depending upon the specific neurotransmitters some channel may be open and some channel may close so in this particular example upon the winding of this neurotransmitter to the receptor the channel is open or channel opens and when the channel is open then an ion or a group of ions can pass through the channel and these ions are specific for a specific neurotransmitter so if an ion carrying positive charge enters the cell upon the binding of the neurotransmitter then there will be increase in the positivity of the intracellular region so ultimately it will lead to depolarization and that depolarization if it reaches the threshold of the action potential then that depolarization will lead to the generation of an action potential if this particular ion which enters into the cell when the channel opens is negatively charged then what will happen it will hyperpolarize the membrane and because of this hyperpolarization the cell will be or the membrane will become more difficult to be excited because it has increased the threshold for reaching it or for initiating an action potential so the overall impact on the excitability of the membrane postsynaptic membrane depends on the type of the ions moving across the membrane upon the binding of the neurotransmitter then let's come to the metabotropic receptors now these metabotropic receptors are also called g protein couple receptors and most of them are being uh, coupled to a protein called G protein these metabotropic receptors when bound by a neurotransmitter will bring a conformation change in the receptor that change in the conformation will be transmitted to the g protein which is attached to the couple to the receptor so upon the binding of the neurotransmitter this g protein get will get activated 
before the arrival of this or binding of this neurotransmitter, the G protein was in the inactive form. But when the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, and because of change in the conformation, that conformation change, ring change in the G protein and gets activated. Once it is activated, then the subunits of this G protein will separate. Particularly, the alpha subunit gets separated and it will bind to other effector proteins. We will see some of the effector proteins which are activated or inactivated by these alpha subunits. And this effector protein upon activation or inactivation may produce some intracellular chemical messenger which we call generally the second messenger and that second messenger will bind to the some ion channel and upon the binding the ion channel may open when the channel opens then it will allow the movement of an ion or a group of ion across the movement across the membrane through the channel and depending upon the particular ion or ions it will lead to the change in the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane as we have discussed in case of anotropic receptors so we see some difference between these two types of receptors but ultimately they will affect the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane in case of this ligand gated ion channels or ion receptors the effect on the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell is relatively quick whereas in case of this metapotropic receptor the change in the membrane potential will be will take longer because it requires many steps for the ion to be ion channel to be activated so which type of <coughs> so this is what we have just discussed how ionotropic receptors affect the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane so here are some of the examples of ionotropic receptors this one is uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor this is GABA receptor and this is glutamate receptors nicotinic acetylcholine receptor when bound to acetylcholine the, the receptor channel ion channel opens and upon the opening of the channel it allows the movement of monovalent positive ions or cations here you see here since the concentration of potassium ion is higher in the intracellular region than the extracellular region, when the channel opens, potassium will move out of the cell. That is, there is efflux of potassium ion 
whereas sodium ion concentration being higher in the extracellular region it will move or flow into the cell but the number of sodium ions entering inside the cell is more than the number of potassium ion moving out of the cell so there is a net positive charge deposition inside the cell and because of this the membrane will get depolarized and if the depolarization is enough to reach the threshold of an action potential then it will lead to the generation of an action potential coming to the GABA receptors which are also uh, ionotropic receptors even though there are some receptors of GABA which are metabotropic also here we are discussing about the ionotropic receptors of GABA GABA means gamma amino butyric acid it is a inhibitory generally regarded as a inhibitory neurotransmitter but you see here the effect of GABA on the neurons is different at different developmental stages when the brain is relatively immature there is when the brain starts to develop the GABA has a stimulatory effect on the excitatory effect on the postsynaptic cell but when the brain is mature or the neuron is mature this GABA has a inhibitory effect on the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell you see here when the neuron is immature the concentration of chloride ion is higher inside the cell and this is the GABA receptor which is a chloride ion conducting channel since the concentration of chloride ion is high inside the cell upon the binding of the GABA to its receptor the chloride ion will move out of the cell so there is depolarization of the membrane so it increases the chances of this synaptic uh, postsynaptic membrane to be excited so it has a excitatory effect on the postsynaptic membrane and we may ask why the chloride ion concentration is high inside the cell this is because there is a transporter present in the young neurons or immature neurons which transport two chloride ion along with one sodium and potassium ion inside the cell so because of this there is higher concentration of chloride ion inside the cell so when the GABA receptor is bound by GABA and the channel opens the chlorine ion will move out of the cell increasing the net positive charges inside the cell that is it depolarizes the membrane 
and depolarization will increase the chances of this membrane to have an action potential. But when the neuron gets mature or the brain is mature, the concentration of chloride ion is higher outside the cell. This is because in mature neurons or developed brain, the chloride ion is pumped out of the cell by a transporter which also transports one potassium ion of the one potassium ion out of the cell so because of this the chloride concentration will be higher outside the cell so when the GABA receptor is bound by GABA the channel will open and upon opening of the channel since the concentration of chloride ion is higher outside the cell it will move into the cell so thereby increasing the net negative charge of the intracellular region and that is nothing but it hyperpolarizes the membrane and because of this hypopolarization it has less chances to get excited so another group of ionotropic receptors is that of glutamate glutamate has both ionotropic and metabotropic receptors these are examples of ionotropic receptors there are three types of uh, ionotropic receptors for glutamate one is called MPA or kinet glutamate receptors another one is this NAMDA receptors in case of AMPA or kinet receptors upon the binding of this glutamate to the receptor the channel opens and allows the movement of sodium and potassium ions so in that way it is very similar to these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors depending upon the concentration of this ion one ion will move more than the other and usually sodium ion concentration being higher outside the cell more sodium will move into the cell and it will lead to the depolarization of the membrane and thereby increasing the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane. In case of this NAMDA receptor, there are many other regulatory factors. But for the time being, let's forget about the other factor. Let's concentrate on the glutamate. If all the factors are already there, necessary factors are already there upon the binding of this glutamate to the receptor the channel will open and when the channel open then it allow the movement of sodium potassium and calcium ions so the main difference between these two groups of glutamate recept ionotropic receptors is that Lambda receptors also allow the movement of calcium ion in addition to the sodium and potassium ions. <coughs> but one 
interesting or factor is that for the glutamate to open the channel it also requires glycine to be bound to the receptor and normally the concentration of extracellular glycine is enough to activate the or open the channel in addition to glycine this particular channel is also controlled by the pore of the channel is controlled by magnesium ions this is the magnesium binding site when the magnesium is bound to this particular region of the receptor then even if there is glutamate and glycine bound to the receptor the channel will remain closed and it has been determined that this magnesium ion will only dissociate from this binding site when the membrane is depolarized so the opening and closing of this particular channel is again depending is de uh, depends on the membrane potential of the postsynaptic membrane if it is depolarized then the magnesium ion will dissociate from the binding site and it will open if the membrane is hyperpolarized then the magnesium ion will bind to the binding site and in that case even in the presence of glutamate and glycine the channel will remain closed so the opening of this channel depends on other ion channels because the membrane potential has to be changed before it can be open let's see uh, which of the neurotransmitters have ionotropic receptors acetylcholine and one group of GABA receptors glycine have ionotropic receptor and these three neurotransmitters share similar organization of the receptor or the channel as you see here acetylcholine has five subunits two alpha one beta one gamma one delta and its subunit has four transmembrane helix that is four transmembrane domain and these domain must be hydrophobic that's why they can remain as part of the membrane integral part of the membrane so 
So they have a, these three groups of the transmitter have a similar type of ionotropic receptors. As we have just seen, the neurotransmitter glutamate has three types of ionotropic receptors MPA, kinate, and MDA. And, and these receptors are tetrameric. That means they have four subunits. Among the four subunits, two of them are similar, and the other the remaining two also are identical. So, in a way, this is A tetrameric protein consisting of two subunits present in two copies. So, altogether, four subunits. Unlike the acetylcholine GABA or glycine receptor, they have three. Complete transmembrane domain. One of the domain is partially embedded into the membrane. The third group, ATP, which is a nucleotide. Also has a anotropic receptor called P2X series. It is primary, and its subunit has two transmembrane domain M1 and M2. So some more exam uh, examples of ionotropic receptors. So, so among the AMPA receptor, it, is, it has further three subtypes and lambda subvent subtypes, kinet. Five subtypes. Serotonin also has ionotropic receptors. It's five ST three A or the three series. <coughs> All the three series are all ionotropic. We will see later that the other remaining receptors of serotonin are metabotropic. Only the three series are ionotropic. So these are the purine ionotropic receptor, particularly for ATP. <coughs> Now let's come to the metabotropic receptors. How these metabotropic receptors affect the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane. So this is a, a typical uh, example of how an neurotransmitter upon binding to its metabotropic receptors 
changes the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane. Here, the receptor protein when bound by the transmitter is coupled to the G protein. Now these G proteins has three subunits alpha, gamma, beta. Upon the binding of this new transmitter to the receptor the change in the conformation of this receptor affects the brings a change in the conformation of the alpha subunit and because of that the GDP which is bound to the alpha subunit is replaced by GTP once GTP is bound to the alpha subunit this alpha subunit dissociates from the other two subunits so this is the active alpha subunit and this active alpha subunit in various ways can affect the postsynaptic cell here in one case the alpha subunit can lead to the opening of a channel here the example of potassium ion channel or it may activate a membrane bound enzyme which may be adenylate cyclase which converts ATP to cyclic AMP or guanyl cyclase which converts GTP to cyclic GMP and this cyclic AMP or cyclic GMP can again activate various proteins particularly thin kinases this activated alpha subunit may also activate other additional intracellular enzymes and in some cases it can even activate gene transcription producing new proteins and bringing structural changes to the postsynaptic cell so these newly synthesized protein may be these ion channels or these membrane bound enzymes so there is amplification of the signal if there is more ion channels then there will be more efflux of this potassium ion and there will be hyperpolarization of the membrane thereby reducing the excitability of the membrane so this is an example where the G alpha subunit either activates an ion channel or membrane bound enzyme bringing a change in the membrane excitability of the postsynaptic cell let's see in some more details how these G proteins which are coupled to the neurotransmitter receptors affect the ion channels these G proteins can directly or indirectly affect ion channels present in the postsynaptic membrane here in the first example 
this is a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor muscarinic acetylcholine receptor Uh, they are called muscarinic acetylcholine receptors because this group group of receptors are activated when this muscarinic acid binds to the receptor so it has a similar effect as to that of acetylcholine binding so in case of this muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, when acetylcholine binds to the receptor, the G protein gets activated and because of the activation of this G protein, the G protein beta gamma subunit activates a potassium ion channel. And because of this, there is efflux of potassium ion, ultimately hyperpolarizing the membrane. So, this particular channel has a inhibitory effect on the excitability of the postsynaptic membrane. On the other hand, the G protein may indirectly affect the ion channels. Here in this case, the channel is controlled by second messenger produced on the activation of the G proteins. This example may be found in case of beta, beta adrenergenic receptors. Upon the binding of the neurotransmitter, the G protein will get activated and the alpha subunit of the G protein will activate adenylene cyclase which will convert ATP to cyclic AMP when there is increase in the concentration of cyclic AMP then it will bind to protein kinase A this protein kinase A is inactive in the absence of cyclic AMP so it becomes active when there is high concentration of cyclic AMP once it is activated this protein kinase A will phosphorylate the potassium ion channel and when it is phosphorylated the channel will open and additionally the protein kinase A upon activation can enter inside the nucleus and activate transcription factors by phosphorylation and this Transcription factors are called CREF cyclic AMP response element binding factors or binding proteins. So, depending upon the particular gene, the gene will be expressed. And if the gene is for this particular ion channel, there will be production of more of this ion channel. 
So in the long run, more potassium ion will move out of the cell because there is increase in the number of potassium ion channel. And because of that, there will be hyperpolarization of the membrane, reducing the excitability of the membrane. So let's see which of the neurotransmitter has metabotropic receptors. These muscarinic uh, receptors are the receptors of acetylcholine, which are metabotropic. As I have said, glutamate also has metabotropic receptor. In addition to the anotropic receptor, there are three classes of glutamate metabotropic receptors. And GABA also has metabotropic receptor, particularly GABA. B receptor, GABA A receptors are ionotropic. Dopamine has five metabotropic receptor, five types of metabotropic receptor. An adrenergic neurotransmitter has two types of metabotropic receptor, alpha and beta. And among the beta, there are different subtypes depending upon the specific alpha subunit. And histamine has four types of metabotropic receptor. So earlier we have seen serotonin also has anotropic receptor and here it also has metabotropic receptor. In fact, it has seven types of receptors. Among the seven types, uh, five is three are ionotropic, and the remaining are metabotropic. And this purine also has metabotropic receptors. There are two classes: those which can be activated by adenosine alone, and those which can be activated by ATP. So these are some of the examples of certain G protein couple receptors of neurotransmitters. So here. Yeah. norepinephrine which binds to beta adrenergic receptor is coupled to gs protein gs is a class of g proteins and this s stands for stimulatory this G proteins are called stimulatory G proteins called because they activate adenyl adenyl cyclase and once adenyl cyclase is activated it will produce cyclic AMP from ATP and this cyclic AMP will activate cyclic AMP dependent protein kinases for example protein kinase A in case of acetylcholine metabotropic receptor, particularly type 1 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, they are coupled to GQ. This is another group of G proteins which activates phospholipase C. And if phospholipase C is activated, then it will produce IP3 from IP2 along with diacylglycerol. 
and IP3 will activate or it will with the release of calcium from the plasmic reticular reticulum and once the intracellular concentration of calcium is increased many biochemical processes will be affected by calcium ion and this DAD will activate gene kinase C another type of acetylcholine metabotropic receptor that is type 2 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor they activate a group of G protein called G beta gamma that is a group of G proteins whose beta gamma subunit also acts as an effector or transducer and this can activate G protein gated potassium ion channel which we have just seen in the earlier slide so in the next lecture uh, we may discuss more about G proteins